Hello, I'm Lynn McLean, and today I'm talking to you about the mobile phone base station that's located at 224 Headland Road, North Kulkul. It's located opposite St Luke's Grammar School and on school property. Today we'll cover some of the relevant issues for parents and administrators, including health and safety and what complying with a standard actually means. And we'll also look at risks to property owners, such as legal liability and insurance. So let's start by looking at the health and safety issues. Mobile phone base stations such as this one emit radio frequency radiation also known as wireless radiation, and exposure to this radiation has been linked with a wide range of harmful effects, including these ones. Now, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, IARC, has classified this radiation as a class 2B, that is a possible carcinogen. And it didn't give a higher rating of a cancer causing effect to this radiation, largely based on the fact that there weren't as many animal studies as it would have liked at the time it made this classification. But since then, there have been some major animal studies showing evidence of cancer as well. So there's now more evidence than when this classification was made. Now, in addition to cancer and brain tumors, this radiation has also been linked with sperm damage and genetic changes, oxidative stress, breaches of the blood-brain barrier that allow harmful chemicals to penetrate the brain, changes to hormones, changes to cells, and a whole range of symptoms. These are just a few of them. Symptoms like headaches and sleep problems, depression and fatigue, stress, skin problems, memory and concentration problems, nausea and loss of appetite, irritability, anxiety, low libido, and behavior problems, including ADHD sorts of symptoms. Now, many scientists are so concerned about the effects of this radiation that they joined together in endorsing the international EMF appeal. And this was sent to the World Health Organization and the United Nations. And this is what these scientists said about the health effects of this radiation. They said that scientific publications show that at levels below national and international standards, effects include increased cancer risk, cellular stress, increase in harmful free radicals, genetic damage, structural and functional changes of the reproductive system, learning and memory deficits, neurological disorders, and negative impacts on general well-being in humans, and harmful effects to plant and animal life. And as a result of this, they called on these organizations to issue more protective EMF guidelines, by which they mean standards, precautionary measures, and to educate the public about the health risks, particularly risks to children and fetal development. Now, a few weeks ago, a new study was published in a peer-reviewed scientific journal, and this is from the International Commission on the Biological Effects of Electromagnetic Fields. And these scientists concluded that adverse effects at levels of radiation that comply with standards include induction of react reactive oxygen species, DNA damage, cardiomyopathy, carcinogenicity, sperm damage, neurological effects, including hyper, uh, electromagnetic hypersensitivity, which we talked about a moment ago. And they said there's also evidence of increased brain and thyroid cancer risks. Now, here's another statement. This was published by two groups. This is uh, the Physicians Health Initiative for Radio, Radiation and Environment. And the second group is the British Society for Ecological Medicine. And this statement was endorsed by scientific and medical groups from many countries. That includes Australia. And you can see here the Oceania Radio Frequency Scientific Advisory Association, known as ORSA from Australia and the, this region. And these doctors and scientists concluded that 
Radio frequency radiation was linked with increased cancer risk, cellular stress, increase in harmful free radicals, genetic damage, structural and functional changes of the reproductive system, learning and memory deficits, neurological disorders, and negative impacts on general well-being in humans. And they said there's clear evidence of carcinogenesis from animal studies. So we've looked at the effects of wireless radiation on health. Briefly, let's take a look now at the effects of living near a base station on health. And this is a study from 2003. It's one of the early studies done by Roger Santini in France. And he investigated symptoms that people experienced when they lived at different distances from a mobile phone base station. And he found that people who lived up to 10 metres from the base station experienced nausea, loss of appetite and visual disturbances. Those who lived up to 100 metres away experienced irritability, depressive tendencies and lowering of libido. Those who lived up to 200 metres away experienced headaches, sleep disturbances and feelings of discomfort. And those who lived 200 to 300 metres away experienced mainly fatigue. Now, this is a, a review that was done on studies on base stations and health. And one of the authors of this was Dr. Vinnie Karana, who's an Australian neurosurgeon who uh, expressed some concerns about how this radiation was impacting on people's health. And their conclusion of this review was that eight of the 10 studies showed increased prevalence of neurobehavioral symptoms or cancer in populations living less than 500 metres from a base station. And they concluded that the current guidelines on which standards are based may be inadequate in protecting the health of human populations. Now, there are more studies as well. The website of the Environmental Health Trust has a summary or has some studies that you can see. And this is a very brief summary of some of their findings. Some of them we've talked about. Symptoms like headaches and memory problems, dizziness, depression and sleep problems. Uh, you can see studies showing increased risks of cancer, including 300% cancer increases, increasing cancer mortality, more symptoms, nausea, headache, dizziness, irritability, discomfort, nervousness, depression, sleep disturbance, memory loss, reduced libido. Uh, changes to hormones and genes, circulatory problems, irritability, depression, blurred vision, sleep and concentration problems, and elevated stress hormones. So you can see that you can see the picture here. So now let's take a look at the base station at 224 Headland Road in North Curl Curl. And let's have a look at what the reports tell us and what that actually means. So what we can do is we can go into the RFNSA website, and that stands for the Radio Frequency National Site Archive. And you can type in the address for any base station in Australia. And if you type in the address for 224 Headlands Road, you'll see this map here, which shows the position of the base station and in the center there and its proximity to St. Luke's Grammar School. Now, it will also tell you who the carriers are on the site. You'll see that there are two carriers, Optus and Vodafone. You can see the technologies there. There are 3G, 4G, 4.5G and 5G. And you'll see that there are eight different frequencies being transmitted. Now, if you look at the top, you can see there are reports. The Panzer EME report. You click on that it will take you to a page that looks like this and you'll see on the bottom right hand side there that number 12.59 this report is showing us that the highest level of radiation from the base station is calculated to be 12.59 percent of the standard so in other words it complies with the standard and it's below the level that the standard allows in australia but that does not mean that it's safe. So let's have a look at some more information. 
So how does this compare to other base stations? Well, I typed in some random uh, postcodes and I clicked on some random reports for base stations. And this is what I found. I found that on the top left-hand side here, that there is a base station at Carrying Bar with two carriers on it. And it is calculated to emit 2.21% of the standard. So compare that to the 12.59% of the base station at Headlands Road. I can see that at Kuna Barabran, there's a base station with two carriers on it, where the maximum exposure is 1.34% of the standard. There's a base station here at Benora Point with three carriers on it, and the maximum exposure there is calculated to be 2.54% of the standard. And you can see here that at Erskine Park, there's a base station with three carriers on it that with the maximum exposure level would be 4.3% of the standard. So these are all very much under the 12.59% at Headlands Road. Now, this was a random survey. I'm not saying it's representative of all base stations, and you can certainly go in and do your own survey like that. Now, what else does this Arpanza report tell us, tell us? It says that at St. Luke's Grammar School, the amount of radiation that students and staff would get would be, it's been calculated to be 23.67% of the standard. Now, you can see that this is higher than at any of these other locations on this table. So for example, at Brookvale Public School, the maximum exposure would be 0.07% of the standard compared to 23.67% of the standard at St. Luke's Grammar. So now let's look at the amount of radiation from this base station in different units, not as a percentage of the standard, but in volts per meter. And what this report shows us that on the top left-hand side here, that we can expect, well, that it's been calculated that there would be an exposure of 18.7 volts per meter at 50 to 100 meters from the base station. And we can also see down the bottom on the right-hand side that it's been calculated that it's at Luke's Grammar School specifically, the amount of radiation would be 27.48 volts per meter. And that's higher than in any of these other locations nearby. So at Brookvale Public School, again, the exposure would be 1.48 volts per meter compared to at St. Luke's Grammar, 27.48 volts per meter. Now, all of these levels comply with the standard, but let's take a look at this for some more information. This table shows us levels that are recommended by different authorities. So at the top, you can see we have the ICNRP guidelines. Now, ICNRP stands for International Commission for Non-Ionising Radiation Protection. So that's a, a body that makes recommendations about how much radiation people should be exposed to. And those guidelines are adopted or modified slightly by many different countries around the world, including Australia. So our standard in Australia is based on these ICNRP guidelines. And you can see that the ICNRP guidelines say it's okay for people to be exposed to 61 volts per meter. Now, at St. Luke's Grammar, the exposure is likely to be 27.48 volts per meter. So it's a lot under the 61. Does that mean it's safe? Well, not necessarily, because have a look at Russia's limits. Russia's limit is six volts per meter. So is Italy's and Switzerland's limit is between four and six volts per meter, just depending on the frequency of the technologies. Belgium has a limit of three volts per meter. Vienna of 1.9 volt per meter. Italy's limit is 0 0.6 volt per meter. 
And the same limit was set by the Bioinitiative Report in 2007. Now, the Bioinitiative Report was put together by a group of independent scientists who reviewed the scientific literature and concluded that based on their, their reading of the literature, people should be exposed to no more than 0.6 of a volt per metre. But they reviewed additional studies in 2012, and in that report, they recommended even a lower level of radiation exposure of 0.03 volts per metre. Now, Salzburg's limit is 0.02 volts per metre. That's for indoor exposure. So compare those with the exposure at St Luke's of 27.48 volts per metre. You can see that St Luke's wouldn't comply with some of those, those limits. So we've said... All of the levels that we've talked about so far at St Luke's Grammar comply with the Australian standard and the ITNOP guidelines, but does that mean they're safe? Well, not necessarily. Now, in the paper I mentioned a little bit earlier, this is a paper by the International Commission on the Biological Effects of Electromagnetic Fields. The scientists reviewed the scientific literature and they concluded that the ICNERP limits on which Australia's limits are based do not adequately protect workers, children, hypersensitive individuals and the general population from either short-term or long-term exposures to radiofrequency radiation. In fact, they came up with 14 things that are wrong with the ICNA guidelines. And, and here's one of them. They said that the ICNIP guidelines and uh, another set of guidelines that are endorsed by the FCC in America, that these guidelines are based on just two studies from the 1980s that involved five monkeys and eight rats. And these animals were exposed to radio frequency radiation for either 30 minutes or 60 minutes. And the researchers observed their behavior and they were looking for changes, for example, pressing a lever to obtain food. And they noticed that changes in behavior occurred when the animals were exposed to levels of radiation that caused a rise in their temperature of their bodies by one degree Celsius. So they concluded that harmful effects on humans occurred when the body heated up by one degree Celsius, and that you don't really have to worry about exposures under that. So just to recap, that's two small studies from the 1980s, short-term exposure, either 30 or 60 minutes, on animals observed for changes in behaviour, and that information has been applied to human health for long-term exposure. Now, that's just one of the, the problems that these scientists observed. They said there are 13 other problems, and they said that based on their observations that exposure limits for radio frequency radiation are based on numerous assumptions. However, research studies published over the last 25 years, that is since the standards were first put together, show that most of those assumptions are not supported by scientific evidence. Now, it's an important paper and you can read it yourself. If you'd like to see a summary, you'll see that on our website. You can uh, check the blog section for that information. So let's look at some of the issues for children and staff at St Luke's Grammar in connection with the radiation from this base station. Now, you saw before that there are many frequencies on that base station, including 5G. And we can expect that in the future, there could be more 5G frequencies. The 5G frequencies that are there now are around 30, uh, well, they are 3,500 um, megahertz. And in the future, they will be higher millimetre waves are expected to be rolled out and perhaps we'll see those added to that facility. We don't know. Now, 5G is interesting because it's a little different to some of the earlier frequencies in terms of the way that the signal is being propagated. It has some new features like this one, massive MIMO, and that is to allow more people to connect to it at once. 
It also has something called beam steering technology. And Telstra describes that like this. It says that the antenna array tracks a user's location and directs a mobile phone signal straight to their device rather than sending it out, rather than sending the signal out in all directions. So it's a little bit like you can see in this picture here with this girl using, let's say, a 5G mobile phone and the beam is traveling towards her mobile phone in particular, rather than being uh, equally spread out around the base station. So what does that mean for the students and the staff at St. Luke's Grammar? Does it mean that if they're using a 5G mobile phone, that they will that the beam of radiation will be focused on that technology and that they will be exposed to more radiation? We don't know. This hasn't happened yet and it certainly hasn't been tested yet at St. Luke's. Now, another thing that we need to think about is the amount of time that children will be exposed to this radiation. And what studies like this are showing, this is study by uh, Dr. Henry Lai and Blake Levitt. They're showing that the majority of studies, as expected, show that long-term exposure is more effective in, ca in causing effects than short-term exposure. So think of it like sunburn. You can spend a few minutes in the sun and you mightn't get burnt. But if you spend a long time in the sun, you probably will. Now, what does that mean? It means that if children are exposed to this radiation from an early age, they have a much longer lifetime ex of exposure than somebody whose exposure didn't start till say they were 40 or 50 or, or 30 or even 20. So what are going to be the effects of that long-term exposure? Well, we don't know. It hasn't happened yet. The other thing that we need to think about is that this it, the exposure from this base station is going to be additional to everything else that our students might be exposed to. It's going to be additional to the other devices that they might be exposed to, their mobile phones, their Wi-Fi, their earpods, their tablets, their laptops, their smartwatches, and so forth and so on. And it will be additional to, to the other stresses in the environment, the, the toxic chemicals, for example, the exhaust fumes of, of uh, traffic traveling past. Now, what the studies are showing is that there's a synergistic effect between radio frequency radiation and toxins. In other words, if you're exposed to both of these, radiation and toxins, the effects are likely to be much worse than the effects of being exposed to, to them separately. And that's, of course, not something that's taken into consideration with uh, with the, the standards that we have in place. So now let's look at some of the important issues for the parents and administrators who make decisions for the school. And the first of these is the risk to property owners. Now, the school has a lease with telecommunications companies that allows them to install their base station on the school's property in return for money. And there are lease arrangements like that all around the country. But here's a potential risk. And this is, is a situation that occurred in Germany earlier this year when a municipality went to court to try to break its lease with a telecommunications company who had a base station on its property. So a similar situation to the school, the person who, or the, the municipality who owned the, the land wanted to break that lease and this is why because the municipality's lawyers identified three risks from having that lease in place risk number one the majority of the scientific studies show that harmful effects occur at exposures below radiation standards risk number two complying with the standards does not remove a municipality's legal risk. Risk number three, municipality administrators are not adequately insured for liability. How much funding should be allocated for adequate cover? In other words, they might be sued and we don't know how much we would have to spend to protect them from that. 
So here's more information in our blog about this particular study. So let's think about what that actually means. My understanding is that the school has a 90-year lease with the telecommunications company. Now, what we know is that technology is moving very quickly. In 1991, we had 2G, 2001, 3G. Now we're up to 5G. In 90 years' time, that'll be around 2112. What generation of technology will we be up to then? And what will it be like? Do we know that it's going to be safe? What do we have to think about? We have we, we know that there's evidence of harm from existing technologies. We know that international standards are potentially not protecting us adequately. So what about these new technologies, the technologies of 2112? Is that going to be safe? Well, it hasn't been invented yet, so we don't know. And it hasn't been tested for safety yet, so we don't know. You can see the risks. Now, here's another issue for schools to consider. Some people, as we said before, are more sensitive to radiation than others and develop symptoms of electromagnetic hypersensitivity. And here's a case of a young girl, a 13-year-old girl in the United Kingdom who was unable to go to school after Wi-Fi was installed at the school because she developed debilitating symptoms, including headaches and insomnia. So as a result of that, she lost a year of her education. Now, her parents began legal action and five years later, that culminated in the court of Judge Edwards. And he made this determination. He said, the only solution available has to be provided in the school. The child requires special education provisions. In other words, he found in the girl's favor and he ordered the school to accommodate her. Now, there are many people in Australia who are sensitive to this radiation, who have electromagnetic hypersensitivity. I talked to a lot of them. Some, uh, some students are unable to go to schools. Some teachers are unable to teach in schools because of radio frequency radiation. So this is not an a unique or a rare situation. It is happening. It is happening in this country. Is it happening at St. Luke's? Will it happen at St. Luke's? We don't know. It's important to have a look at what the insurance industry is doing and thinking about this issue. Now, Swiss Re is a reinsurer. It's in other words, it's a company that provides financial protection to other insurance companies. And in 2013, it released a report called Emerging Risk Insights, in which identified electromagnetic radiation as a high risk. And the reason it did that, you can see here, the World Health Organization has classified radio frequency electromagnetic fields, such as radiation emitted by cell phones, as potentially carcinogenic to humans. And a recent ruling by an Italian court suggested a link between mobile phone radiation and human health impairment. In other words, there's evidence of risk and insurers need to be aware. So how is that playing out? Well, some insurance companies are now not covering risks related to electromagnetic fields. And here's an example. This is A&E &E Insurance, and it has an exclusion, exclusion 32 on page 7 of its policy, where it excludes electromagnetic fields. And look at all the words it uses to make sure it's covered everything to do with them electromagnetic fields directly or indirectly arising out of, resulting from, or contributed to by electromagnetic fields, electromagnetic radiation, electromagnetism, radio waves, or noise. So it's taking no chances there. It's covering everything in its exclusion. Now, Already there are some courts that have recognised that radio frequency radiation causes health problems. In Italy, as we heard a moment ago, a court determined that a mobile phone 
use or man's mobile phone use caused his brain tumour. Recently, there was the same court issued another judgment, basically the same thing where he said another man's mobile phone use was caused, uh, of course, his brain tumour and that he would need to be compensated. An Australian court awarded compensation to a man for symptoms that he developed from being exposed to wireless radiation at work. A French court determined that exposure caused symptoms of electromagnetic uh, sensitivity. A Spanish court ordered compensation for electromagnetic hypersensitivity. And an Indian court determined that a mobile phone tower would need to come down because it had caused someone's cancer. So let's summarise. Is radiofrequency radiation a risk? Well, it's been classified as a class 2B carcinogen by the International Agency for Research on Cancer. And since then, there's even more evidence linking it to cancer. Scientists and medical practitioners say it's a risk. Insurers say it's a risk. Courts say it's a risk. And scientists and medical practitioners are saying that the standards are not protecting us. So where does that take us? How do we deal with these risks? Well, many organisations have risk management policies, and I see that St Luke's Grammar School does too, where it says that in its policy that it would address risks to student safety, that they will be identified and risk management strategies developed and implemented. So moving forward, it seems appropriate for parents and administrators like the ones at St Luke's to be addressing these risks and asking these sorts of questions. Is this exposure safe for students' health? What is the legal risk to the school? What is the financial risk to the school and to the administrators individually? Does insurance cover radiofrequency radiation? Do we take precautions? what precautions do we take, what policies are already in place and what policies are needed. Now, these are big decisions with important outcomes. The outcomes are the health of our children and the health of our community. I hope this talk has helped point you towards the issues that you need to consider as you move forward and wish you well with your next steps. So I'd like to thank you for your attention. It's been a pleasure to talk to you tonight.